All right, everybody. Hello, and welcome to mock interview number 103 with a software engineer. My name is Albert. I'll be your host. I am of Albert's List. And we're here to help you with your mock interviews. And today, we have a very special guest. Corey, as you know, our regular mock interviewer, is out on vacation. And with me is my very good friend, Fong. He's a software engineer, and he's here today to do a technical mock interview with Abhinav, who recently graduated from Columbia with a master's degree. Uh, the way that these usually work is we ask questions, Fong will ask the questions, and Abhinav will answer. This one takes on a little bit more of a technical angle, so uh, we'll have Fong control that from end to end. If you have any questions yourself, feel free to enter them in the webinar chat, or if there's any time, ask your own questions along the way. Without further ado, Fong, it's really great to have you. Um, we've been talking about you doing one of these for a really, really long time, and it's good to finally have you here. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me all right. Uh, let me know. Uh, yeah, a uh, brief introduction about myself. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I've uh, been working in the field since uh, 2017 or so. Uh, it's not too long, not too short either. Uh, time flies. Um, but uh, outside of work, I also do a tutoring for software engineers. So uh, I've, I've run a number of uh, mock interviews, uh, been on both sides of the interview panels, uh, been both the candidates uh, many, many times, uh, as well as, you know, uh, interviewers. So uh, somewhat familiar with the process of this. So, um, yeah, uh, today we are going to do a kind of more or less a more technical uh, version of um kind of interview, uh, give everyone some insight into how it runs and also hopefully uh, to help Ebenov uh, to be more well prepared for, you know, uh, what's uh, what's come ahead, right? So yeah, uh, with that said, uh, could you tell us a few things about you, Ebenov, and, you know, uh, just kind of what uh, you're looking for in your next opportunities or so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Albert and Fong. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Abhinav. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I completed my undergraduate from India, from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. And then I was a software engineer in Tokyo for about four years before coming to the US and Colombia. Uh, I started in September 23 and uh, I graduate actually in December 24. So I graduate in one more semester. So I'm in my summer, uh, you know, summer period right now. The next I'm looking for are full-time jobs in software industry uh, starting from January. So that is the reason I'm practicing practicing for technical interviews and system design interviews. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. thanks for that uh, intro. So, you know, uh, we have time in the end. I make sure to leave some time to ask more questions and everything. But uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, let's kind of kick this off, right? Uh, so uh, as you mentioned, uh, you, you have some experience with uh, software development in the past. Well, four years is quite a lot of time in software. Um, so uh, could you kind of describe uh, an experience of kind of like working and maintaining a uh, large scale distributed system? It's okay if you uh, work mainly on the UI stuff we can switch to, but uh, that's kind of what I, li I like to kick off as. Oh, awesome. So uh, I worked at a company called Rakuten in the mm -hmm. past. So that was the that was the only place where where I worked with fairly large scale distributed system, because I started out my career and uh, I was not working in a large scale distributed system when I started out my software engineering career. Um. So in Rakuten, so the service was a storage pipeline, where I uh the the situation in the company was. If the customer, uh, if the merchant who the, it was an e-commerce platform, if the merchant uh, uploads any uh, item in the marketplace, it needs it needed to be persisted in a database. So, uh, my team provided an API for different services within the company. E-commerce was one of the services which Rakuten provides. It has other branches like travel, uh, fashion, and other services. So, our team provided an API for the downstream clients, the merchants in e-commerce example, to upload the data. So the UI team of that particular service will use our API to you know, 
uh, streamline the data from the source to the databases. So our team was providing the CPI to, you know, connect the data from, you know, the UI, wherever, wherever the source to the database and was also the... uh, index it. It was a search team. So we also did a lot of indexing. I was not in part of, you know, the search core team, but uh, the group also did uh, indexing and then providing the search results. I see. That is uh, the high level overview. I see, I see. Oh, so uh, you were kind of like the, the, the adapter layer to kind of uh, where for all the team to like use the API to interact with different systems. Am I am I getting that correctly? Sort of what what your your team was doing, right? Right. Okay. That sounds okay. about right. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. So so uh, with that, um, uh, did you have any experience working directly with the database or mostly just on like the the API layers of things? And and how much is it uh um, to kind of interacting directly with you know writing tables and uh, stuff like that? Yeah, we did not. Uh, our team did not work with the uh, database directly, so we were using. Uh, we did not manage the databases, so we were using Cassandra uh, as the database. We did not manage the Cassandra cluster directly, but we were using APIs on top of uh, you know what Cassandra provides in Java. To issue the right commands, you know there. I see. I, but the okay, Cassandra database itself, we were not managing. I see. That was uh, by a different team. Okay. Uh, have you have you had experience working with different databases like Postgres and stuff like that? If you do, uh, what do you what what would you say? Kind of like some of the uh, differences between Cassandra and, for example, like a, like a MongoDB or like a Postgres uh, system. Oh, cool. So uh, as we know, Cassandra is a NoSQL database. So uh, it works on unstructured data well, uh, whereas Postgres is a relational database. So if you want to have like uh, um, joins, if you want to have queries to you know join different tables, if there is a relation, intrinsic relation in the data you have, then something like a relational database would be useful for you. But uh, in terms, uh, in respect of what our data was, it was very unstructured. It was item data, right? And the, uh, the columns of the item can be different for different items, for different merchants, for different types of products. So Cassandra was, it, it's uh, also highly scalable mm -hmm. uh, because Cassandra has uh, these properties of, you know, scaling to a really large amount of uh, data points. Yeah. So uh, that is the reason we used a NoSQL database, Cassandra, uh, for this exam for this data we have. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, I would say like ninety percent of the time, you Cassandra can be like the default answer, right? Because just just because it's a column database, and you can just spin how massive the column can be. That does. That's kind of right. like the deep. yeah I yeah I'm asking because uh, yeah I, I I used to work at Walmart Labs and, and I was working on the item uh the, the item section also so yeah we just kind of stuff everything into Cassandra and just uh, flap it and then shove the whole thing <laughs> into the Cassandra cluster yeah cool uh so. So um let's continue. So so you met uh you mentioned you you're not interacting directly with the database. So that that probably uh, sometimes can create some friction, right? Between like uh what what like uh, your product people want your API to do and what's possible with it, right? Can you kind of uh give an example of of, of like a time where like um you have issues with uh, kind of you know working with the people that are managing the the actual database and your PM and how would you kind of like go around uh like dealing with that those kind of situations. Oh cool. So uh I was with uh Rakuten for around one year before I came to New York. So um I did not personally have issues, but I've heard a lot from, you know, more senior members in the team about the issues, uh, you know, uh, they had interactions with the uh, team, which was actually managing the databases. So uh, the teams which were managing the databases, they provide certain SLAs to us, you know, uh, these are the number of rights we can support. 
and uh, you know this is the amount of data we can support and uh, our upstream clients they had certain requirements for us so we did we did our best to you know scale and you know uh, accept as many requirements as possible from the upstream clients but if the downstream service which is you know uh, the actual databases uh, is not able to provide it, the SLA is not uh, you know uh, that if, if the SLA does not satisfy the requirement of the upstream client the merchants in this example then you know we just uh, see this we, we talk to the PM of our team to explain all the you know strict requirements of the database and then the PM talks to you know the uh, the clients we had that is yeah. the much you know the merchant facing teams the services in this example you know the e commerce team the fashion team okay okay let me see uh, last question before we go to the more technical aspect of this is um uh. What do you do kind of like keep yourself up to date with stuff? Because um, for example, in tech, you know, uh every day sometimes something new coming out, right? So uh what, what do you kind of uh, do to keep up with that? And yeah, and then what's kind of like the the, the process that that's you uh, you've been doing and so far to kind of keep up with that between you know, your your school work and also with like the industry because as you know a school kind of teach you some stuff but then when you go into the real world it's completely different yeah yeah so uh for keep, keeping up with the industry you know the practices i have subscribed to a bunch of newsletters like bite bite go uh high high growth engineer and certain other newsletters so, which gives me a brief snapshot of, you know, what uh, what are the practices followed in the industry currently? What are the trending practices? And of course, the school, uh, the uh, courses I've taken in the school are very much related to, you know, uh, what I might potentially use in the industry, like distributed systems, for example. So, it gives me, it clears the low level knowledge, the school, and, you know, uh, these new newsletters tell me how, what are the actual technologies used in practice. So that bridges the gap. Mm, cool. Yeah. Uh, that 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 that's, uh subscribe uh that uh, newsletter by Twico is, is pretty useful for interview. Uh, I guess I would say. Uh, some of the, you're interested in reading a book that will help you a lot. Uh, personally, help me is a design design intensive. Uh, let me find it. Design intensive. Uh. Data application. That that last one is a very good book. Um, if you ever try to uh pick up something that's a little bit more uh more, I would say more in the academic educational side. That's I share that. Um, this book is very it's very dry though. Uh, with, uh, just a warning, but it's it's very useful. Anyway, cool. Uh, let's go to the technical part of this so again uh is uh we we well uh this is going to be more of a system design i try to kind of understand what you know uh whether or not if you are more uh, stronger on the front end by all means you can do that if you know more about the back end by all means do that but lean in one side versus the other don't do both in the system design interview because it's uh you usually won't have enough time for that uh, kind of works the overall things cool so uh before we go uh, uh, uh let me ask you if you, uh, so so you you're familiar with distributed system right things such as yeah. uh, working with a lot of microservices uh are you familiar with things like uh locks locking systems like uh, things like amplitude sentry and stuff like that or like a splunk any of those uh system right uh pretty pretty much for example splunk uh uh whenever there's an error rises in one of the system uh you should be able to go to splunk uh see it and then you know trace the report, for example right so uh the system beside is going to be uh say you work in Recruiting, uh an e-commerce website so we want to design a locking system for the IWs uh, stuff, 
uh, where the, whatever on the item we want to lock up. Uh, however, if you want to do this, uh, it's up to you, but that's going to be a problem. Uh, as usual with this system design uh, interview, it's going to be fairly open-ended. Uh, there are right answers and there are wrong answers. Uh, so, but, but then there's a lot of you know right answer in between, right? So try to go within that frame of uh, we are going to try to design a locking system. Uh, like Splunk, for example, it is going to be on top of uh, Rakuten item pages. How would we do this? Uh, feel free to share your screen if you have it. Uh, you have yes. Excalibur, just uh, start uh, going away at it, and yeah, and uh, I will. If you have questions, uh, feel free to ask me. Yep. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Uh, so actually, I'm not aware of locking services. I've uh, not used any locking services in the past. So okay. I would love to know a little bit more about okay. uh, the system we are designing. Okay, let me clear it. I was just practicing a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, that's so okay. Uh, let's... Okay, so it's okay. Uh, okay, so you will run into situations. I'm gonna break out characters. So you in interviews, you will run into situations where you might not have any ideas about how the system works, or you've never seen it, right? Like you might run into questions like design, uh, for example, like 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 a uh, like like something like an uh, image processing service, right? Things like that. It's okay. To run when you run into those uh things it's good to ask uh to ask about the system but you want to ask things that are more concrete that can give you clue on how to do it, right so for example with uh for example with a kind of blocking system i give you kind of one question that you can ask and then you know you keep kind of keep going uh, oh it's not it's not locking it's locking uh l o g Logging. I see. I yeah, see. Yeah, logging. I, you know, <laughs> I, I know logging systems. Okay, uh, yeah. there you go. Yeah, cool. 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 Well, yeah, uh, that's that's my bad. Uh, sometimes I, uh, <laughs> my I accent was... will, uh, will confuse people. Uh... Logging system, got it. Yes, yes. So, uh, Logging okay. system would be a good uh, question to how would you, you know, like if, uh, uh, for example, you can have like, yeah, locking would be, good. but today we're going to talk about locking. Yeah. Uh, so I would want to know a little bit more about uh, this, uh, the logging system. So can you explain me, uh, okay, what are we logging? And is it like a distributed logging, like uh, Yeager, for example? Or is it like uh, it's tracing logging, it's error logging? Or is it like uh, if any function produces a non-significant error or non-breaking error, should we log that? What are we logging here? Okay. Uh, I want to, okay, at, at the minimum, uh, I want it to be traceable if possible, right? Traceable, which means that, okay. Which means if if it's originated on system number five and it kind of snaked through the whole thing, I should be able to kind of see like it has hit, say, five and then something downstream and then eventually short, right? Tra traceable locking is good. Uh, okay. Another requirements. This this one might be difficult. Uh, if you cannot do it, it's okay. Uh, it's it's, it's real time. Uh, which means is that if I go to a dashboard, I see it real time. If you don't want to do it, if you cannot do it real time, it's okay to kind of have like a five minutes delay or something like that. Right. That's another one. Uh, Got it. The third question. The third thing is, is it has to be highly consistent system right like the, the consistency needs to be good right like if if i am in europe and i look at the law and i'm in south america i look at the law it has to be the same right like like you you, you can delay it whatever but the moment that uh anyone look at the law system it has to be the same right you cannot just have like say uh happy enough you can be in like uh japan you look at the law and then uh, I'm here, you know, we on the Zoom call and I tell you like, hey, I see that error and then you like, well, I don't see it yet because you know it's not like propagating. That that's 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 not good, right? So it's so consistency should be uh some of the 
the important thing I would say traceability and consistency of the system should be good. Uh, real time, good if you can make it real time. Otherwise, it's okay. Got it. Yeah, okay. These uh, so, should be the functional requirements that we are I go with. Got it. Just to clarify one thing, is it uh, similar to what Yeager does? So it's like open tracing where um, any component of the system, if it receives a API request, it sends a particular trace ID, a transaction mm -hmm. ID to a central system, and then a central system stitches everything together to form a distributed trace. Is that what we want here when we, when uh, we talk about traceable logging? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, you know, all these systems say like Splunk, they have their own query thing, right? Like if I paste in the trace ID, it should show me like where the thing has come from, right? That's cool. Yes. Got it. So it's more mm -hmm. like uh, what open tracing does. Yeah. Cool. All right. And uh, can we talk about like the number of uh, functions you are dealing with, the number of microservices we have, and the amount of uh, queries per second which these microservices will be, you know, uh, will be expected to have, will be, ex you know, will face, will, you know. Okay, uh, yeah. it's, it, it runs on the item page. So this part is up to you to kind of give me the uh, the idea of what you think uh, we cool. need to write. Because uh, we mainly concern about the item page logging systems. Awesome. So And, and, uh, and, and also, also one thing before I forget, uh, non-functional requirement can be something like uh, you should be able to, for example, uh, have alerting system, right? Like if it... Uh, Scream up, it should be able to send a pager or it should be able to call someone, right? Uh, or lock it somewhere. But yeah, uh, it, it needs to be it, it needs to be alertable something in some way. Yeah. Got it. Mm, all right. So um yeah. Again, if we talk, let us do uh so are there any other non-functional requirements like uh, we talked about scale and are we talking about multi-regions or Microsoft or the audiences we are catering, you know, present in different regions is that, that, that has to be the re, uh, fun, that is the functional requirements, right? Because the functional is uh, that if I'm in Europe or in Japan, yeah, I need to see the exact same log, right? It cannot be delayed. Like if you delay five minutes, it's okay, but after five mm -hmm. minutes, no matter where I, I look at it, uh, it has to be the same. So consistency right. needs to be highly consistent. And oh, also it needs yeah. to be highly durable also, right? Like the, the system needs to be highly durable because uh yeah, if uh, if my locking goes down and I'm in huge trouble because then I have no idea what else is. Uh, so uh, the, the availability needs to be fairly high for this too. Cool. Uh, what, I was, uh, what I was asking is that the microservices which we are having, could they be present in different uh, regions, for example? Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, so up to you. Yeah. Up to you. Okay. Uh, if, whichever easier for you to do. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, okay, we talked about uh, it should be just to, you know, recreate our functional requirements so that I'm, uh, we are on the same page. It, it is a traceable logging system which we are building. Uh, it should be highly consistent, which means that within certain threshold, five minutes in our example, uh, if it is present in once, if it is visible from uh, one region, it should be visible from all the or you know wherever we queried from the logs, and uh, the data should be highly uh, durable. So the third point is more about availability. The fourth point is highly durable. So uh, do we store the data? up till a certain point, for example, one month, two months, what is the, till forever. when do we store the storage? Uh, actually forever is, forever. Uh, I would say, uh, it, it has to be queryable quickly within like a year span. After that, you can put it in like a data freezer somewhere when it okay. can take longer, but uh, yeah, it, it within the first year, it needs to be, uh, fairly queryable. Okay, cool. So that gives me a brief idea about how we are going to design the system. Um, just to do a few back of the envelope calculations, 
I want to know uh, what is the amount of data we are dealing with. So uh, let me make a box here. So suppose we have uh, 100,000 merchants uh, in a particular region. Suppose if we, if we are dealing with multi-region support for our, if our uh, e-commerce platform is a multi-region platform, Rakuten was majorly in one region in Japan, but if you have a multi-region e-commerce, also one thing is, uh, are we doing a multi-region e-commerce platform or a single region e-commerce platform? Because the back of the envelope calculations will change. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, just do a single region. Single region, okay. Yeah. So in a single region, suppose uh, we have 100,000. Uh, is that number reasonable? 100,000 merchants? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, okay. It's... Suppose we have 100,000 merchants uh, monthly. And each merchant has maybe 100 products per day. Uh, 100 products per day, maybe 100 products per month. Yeah, just do 100 per month. Yeah, so your, your okay. calculation is more controlled. Yeah. yeah, so 100 products per month. And if we have, for example, 10 microservices, uh, maybe 10 is a, you know, a low number, maybe 100 microservices yeah. where, where the request can potentially touch. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, uh, when the merchant uploads the data, it can touch up to a hundred microservices where, you know, uh, it, you know, has different uh, mm -hmm. functionality, for example, shipping price, uh, the logistics, et cetera, et cetera. Is, uh, 100, 100, I would say quite a lot. Let, let's, let's do 10 because uh, realistically, okay. I've, I've never seen hundred in one pipeline. I think I mean you you do probably something like like Amazon does, but uh, so we 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 are a small company. We we cannot have hundred microservices. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. I suppose we have uh, ten microservices, and mm -hmm. um, okay. Suppose uh the data we are sending. Uh, whenever it receives a request, what I'm thinking in the back of my mind is that similar to what Open Tracing and Jaeger does, whenever it re a microservice receives a request, it will, uh, you know, generate a small uh, data packet containing the transaction ID and little bit metadata about the API request and send it to a central server. So uh, the size of this data packet will be maybe 2 KB okay. per request. Okay. Okay. So, and the number of uh, requests we are having in this uh, in this scenario, which we have calculated here would be a million, 10 million. Okay. 10 million requests per month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it would be like, 100 million requests per year? Okay. Okay, I think per month should be sufficient and the amount of data we'll be having would be 10 million requests per month and two KB, right? So it would be 20 million KB. And that would be, let me note it down. Yeah. yeah. Six, 20 million KB. You need to use Google to convert it, it's okay. So ten power three, uh, so ten power three MB, and uh, this would be twenty GB. Uh, Is that right? Yeah, just say just just yeah, up per month. Yes. Cool. So we have twenty GB of data which we are which we will be dealing with per month. Cool. Twenty GB uh, in the back of my mind is not a lot but we would be persisting it across months. So it would be like 200 GB per year. And uh, we are storing it for a year, it should be fast, right? So 200 GB is not a lot. That's nice. Uh, are we just storing all this in one thing? Because um, don't, don't you want to kind of, kind of, uh, you know, break them down or uh, just, yeah, Be because you you're not gonna stop this into one uh, data cluster. Right? Yeah, so. because two hundred GB. Yeah, it would be, and also we need to also uh, have availability, right? What if mm -hmm. the, if you store it in one server, if the server fails, 
then we will have a problem also mm -hmm. we want to have uh, the are we having a latency requirement for example a person from the us should have should be able to query the data within certain sla within certain time uh yes because uh for example if we are going to have real time right that that has to be okay. uh, that has to be low latency so say something like 500 milliseconds sla for latencies oh, all right all right. So since we have a 500 millisecond latency, then we would definitely, uh, at the back of my mind, need to have a replication, the G, uh, replication within a region, and also geo replication for the, uh, for satisfying this real time requirement. Okay. So uh, at the basics, starting from a rough API design, what I would be thinking is that the source of the data wherever uh, we need to instrument the code bases of course for this so every microservice which you are dealing with will be instrumenting in the code saying that whenever i receive a request if i'm generating the request for the first time then i will be uh, making a unique transaction id for this we will have a maybe a server which generates unique transaction ids yeah. So let us say something like transaction ID server. Yeah. So uh, this particular server will basically uh, will generate globally unique transaction IDs mm -hmm. and uh, give it to the requester. So uh, suppose we have microservices. Let me draw that. Uh, I think it was this. Okay. So we have different microservices. The first thing they would be doing is request. Uh, if they are the start, if uh, these uh, this is the microservice which is initially creating the request, mm -hmm. they will be talking to this transaction ID server. And of course, because these micros uh, we are talking about a single region, so uh, that should be you know, and uh, we have how many ten microservices, right? But these 10 microservices could be spread across different servers in different uh, parts of, you know, uh, different zones. So we would add the number of servers running these microservices can be quite huge. So uh, what I would think is that I would place the transaction ID server behind a load balancer over here. Okay, I think I have the load balancer. I'll just explain uh, what I mean by this in a second. So why I need a load balancer is that this these microservices can be running on different servers. It can be like maybe 100,000 servers. Uh, and these are microservices, right? So they can be multiple uh, microservices running on the single bare metal system. Uh, mm -hmm. ba basically, that's a, these are like Docker containers. And uh, they would ask if they are the originator of the you know the request they would be asking for a unique transaction ID and a single server cannot handle it because that will be a bottleneck and that will, you know, not, that will slow down the entire request. We want the... How about, how about instead of having, instead of you requesting a transaction ID every time that you get a request, right? Why don't you have each of the, each of your like microservice homes, uh, like the pool of transaction ID, right? Because what you can do is you can have a transaction ID server, just do like an offline workers, right? And then just distribute the, the IDs to the server so that you don't need the load balancer because because you just do the ID generations on like an offline schedule, right? And then each of the system just kind of hold like a bunch of um, IDs when it get low and you can request for more batches, new ones, new it, batch. right? Yeah, Be because if you because if you hold it, uh, you hold the ID, you can cut down the whole complexity of like, well, we need to do this, and then your transaction ID just becomes uh becomes your thing. Uh, Peter does say localizes transaction ID generation. The problem with that is that you are you 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 always can run into the chance of having collision if you are localizing transaction ID generation. Uh, 
in the smaller system, yeah, you can do that. But in something, for example, if you lock things like Twitter, you can't just do local ge uh, generation because at some point, inevitably, you are going to have, um, yeah, a collision. If someone interested, read up on what uh, uh, Twitter does with, um, with their ID generation. They have a giant system that they call the Snowflake ID generation. It will help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can do, but if you want to guarantee like uniqueness, just batch it and then have the 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 system itself keep the keep the IDs. I think that's is that, that will kind of reduce a lot of issues yeah. of worrying for it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh we can do that. So whenever the system runs out of uh, the unique IDs, then it can instead of requesting uh the trans transaction ID for one unique ID, the server can request the transaction ID server for a batch of for maybe um, 100,000 IDs at once and can store it locally. Yeah, when it get low, right? You, because each server can know like, well, if I get to say 15% of the pool that I request yeah. for refill, yeah. And then you can just Got save all the, all the transaction ID in this old table somewhere, just grab from there, right? So. Yes, but uh, in this case, we but in this case too, I think we will need a load balancer because uh, the number of microservices, the number of servers yeah, yeah, we, for sure. we have, yeah, yeah, would, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, you still need have... it, yeah, yeah, you still need it, but it's not yeah. as like Required. constant as the other mm. one. It's not as busy, uh, uh, not as you know, busy all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, cool. So, and this will also have, I think, multiple. Okay. And then once it yeah, gets... yeah, you can just assume the transaction ID itself is already its own thing, and it's yeah, just assume it's a black box. It's okay. You don't have to go deep into that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So um. Once our microservice, uh, our initial microservice receives a transaction ID, then uh, it will create a basically to create a data packet, how a message, and send it to a central server, saying that this is my uh, trace. Is it called a trace? Yes. So this is my. Um, I forget the terminology used in open tracing. Okay, uh, we can call it a tracing server. Yeah, just call it a whichever. Yeah, it's okay. Cool. So our any uh, the microservice will basically create a message, and uh, we need to think about the protocol in which it will communicate with this tracing server. Well, it need it needn't be a full duplex. It can be a single. What I mean is that we don't need something like web sockets. We can have a HTTP request, which yes. it will send a one way request. To yeah, the you don't. You, so. you you yeah. You shouldn't need web socket. If you need like a push pull thing, you can always just throw like, like a Kafka, and it will do that for you too. Yes, you... I think we will definitely need Kafka over here because uh, uh, since. We cannot rely on the if the tracing server is busy, for example, even if you have a load balancer, if you have a load balancer here similarly, and uh, we give it here and give it to the tracing server, that would not work because uh, all the tracing server needs to know about the state because someone needs to st stitch all the requests together. So I think uh, we would need something like Kafka uh, to, you know, because Kafka will handle about uh, the data consistency across different Kafka servers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, you know, stitching, uh, stitching from any of the tracing servers will, will give us the same result. So uh, we will have like a pub sub service like Kafka. So these, uh, these microservices can send the uh, messages to a pub sub server. Kafka. 
a message broker i i'm debating about uh, if we use rabbit something like rabbit and q versus kafka but i think uh, kafka should do our job pretty well because it is highly scalable compared to rabbit and q it has the latency guarantees and it's also a database right like this is rabbit it's just a message broker so yeah if if uh, again if you run into this situation at uh during the interview it's always okay to say a more robust uh thing rather than that just use like yeah because it, it, between rabbit and q you yes saying kafka is not the wrong answer it, it's just maybe it's overkill for certain things but it's it's yeah it, it's it's good if you kind of you know just kind of have the default answer to stuff like cassandra you need uh a uh, uh, no sequel and if you need kind of like the messaging uh, database thing with consistency then just throw the kafka there well, okay so um i'm thinking about uh, i have like one uh, two design patterns uh, you know competing in my mind should the tracing server directly consume the Kafka topic, or should it read from a database after persisting the data, or can it happen parallelly? Because what I'm thinking is, if some okay, the messages will not be lost because Kafka takes care of it. Yeah, it won't get because it's a database, right? It, it will sit there and until you want to expunge it. And uh, we can have something like uh, you know uh, Cassandra over here to persist the data for longer term uh, storage. Yeah. Because Kafka persists it for uh, you know limited duration, mm -hmm. so we can have Cassandra for longer term storage. And yeah, of and, course, yeah, and it's okay to read off the Kafka directly, right? Like you, yeah. you can just do both. You can save and yeah. read at the same time without yeah. having to worry about uh, yeah. write back and stuff like that. So I think uh, there is one thing here because uh, the reading directly from Kafka will solve our real time requirements of 500 milliseconds. But if we want to query historical data, like uh, what was the trace one year back, then Kafka wouldn't have the data anymore. Yeah, yeah. Then you so, just read from Cassandra, right? Because yeah. when when you send that query, your API generally we have like a query branch, right? Like if if the times exceed certain thing, then you just route it away. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we can say it's for the old data, yeah? and whenever a uh, service, whenever maybe uh, if if we just think about you know web clients requesting a trace, then it can talk to the tracing server. Maybe we definitely need one more load balance over here to talk to the Are tracing server. Are you familiar with like an elk stack uh, where, you know, it will handle like most of these for like most of the like uh, query and visualization and stashing shape for you, right? Because it's it just, just elastic search log stash in the key bar, and you just mix them together in something that you get like all of the visualization as well as like, like most of the thing that we will have. You so you just like you can put like an L stack like to yeah. come on the tracing system if you have to, but yeah, this is kind of like a quick audit. Just yeah, if you're not familiar, read it up. It's really helpful for a lot of like the like things that you need like just deal with a bunch of data. Yeah, got it. So we can, uh, so this ELK stack goes on the tracing server, is it right? Yeah, you can do that too, it's fine, okay. yeah. So let's see. Okay, so ELK stack to read the data to for visualization and searchability. Yeah. Yeah, because oh. if you mentioned that you, you don't if you don't really have to kind of talk too much about what's the else like all the elastic search stuff, right? Because the if you just have it before you know, okay, that that's what it exactly does for you for like all of the visualization and part. Awesome. Then uh 
we'll have an API server which will um which will talk to this uh, elk stack to get the data for our clients. So the clients will talk to the API server. So our clients, let me see if I have clients over here. Okay. We'll talk to the API server behind, of course, there will be a load balancer. And and this API server will talk to the for visualization. Uh, so here we so uh, till now does the design look reasonable? Is there any uh, questions you wanted to ask? Um, what is it? What is like the last schema that you are gonna start into the Cassandra? Oops. So in Cassandra, uh, what I will be, so Cassandra stores after the stitching is done. So our tracing mm -hmm. server will handle all the stitching from different microservices. It doesn't see individual traces from each microservice. It, it sees the full uh, transaction. Okay. So Cassandra will have one transaction ID. So uh, if I just, you know, put the transaction ID, uh, will, uh, put the schema here, which I will store in Cassandra, uh, what happened? Okay, one second. I probably want to do some select. Oh. Like I cannot select my Excalibur. Mm. It it's not. It's like it froze for some reason. Did you click anything? <laughs> no, I said there. Okay, it's working now. Okay. Cool. Sorry about that. It's up. Okay, sorry about that, what's happening here? Uh, for some reason it uh, it froze again. It's okay, it's okay. Uh let's let's wrap this 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 up then. Uh it's okay. Yeah. You can um uh a few things I I I, I will kind of uh kind of my overall feedback with this. I mean you, yeah. this is this is okay. Uh so one of the thing I, I would say to kind of do earlier is get the table schema uh, out first, uh, like after you get the, after you get the first part of talking about like requirements, you should get that out and also write like the API, uh, like what your API that you're going to use just, you know, like query the logs, right? Because uh, that part should, should should be in and you need to kind of get that i just say like you know like what's the api like what is the get and the post request you're gonna have right like what uh what and and how would people like kind of query uh within like certain amount of time right like like a cursor query or something like that like what so those are the, the the two things you should you should definitely get it out before you draw because once you draw it out it's too late to kind of uh, and you don't want to miss that. Uh, that those are huge points to lose. Another thing is, uh, for the back of the the envelope calculation, to speed through that quick. Uh, it's good that you mention it, but um, uh, it's okay if you don't have it. Uh, if you have it, just kind of say quickly. Don't even ask too much for, uh kind of validation. If you if you're gonna do it, just say like, well, uh, assume a hundred thousand monthly user uh gonna have everyone say 100 product blah, blah, blah. this is what the number is gonna be uh my estimation right uh another thing is you should always uh just mention replications in your uh when you save stuff because um you you, you know just at minimum say like uh, we're gonna have like three replications uh if it's not if it's too little, it will tell you, but those are just, you know, just time by three, so time by five, things like that, right? Um, another thing is uh, where you, where you kind of uh, talk about your experience and stuff like that, um, it's okay to kind of tell the, the interview like, hey, 
I need uh, 30 seconds or a minute to uh, collect my thoughts and then just write out what you have in mind and be like, okay, uh, this is what I've done, things like that. No, you don't have to answer right away. Just, you you, you can always pause the, the thing, take back some of the time that you have. Uh, yeah, those are kind of my uh, uh, thing, but definitely the most important thing is get your table schema and get your API, because it, it will help you a lot rather than do it. Uh, Front load those info. Cool. Got it. So yeah. the, uh, the uh, API for the services which, which we are using, right? For example, the transaction ID server for the tracing server here for in this example. Well, the, the API people might interested in like, okay, if I'm on the API server and I'm on the computer and trying to get the log, uh, I want to build like a table. What 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 am I going to query? Right, like what? What is the API I'm gonna I'm gonna do? I see. For it, right, and then like you, you have the say if you have a table schema for your stuff, it helps. It's pretty easy for the API because you just dump that in as like a like 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 a get right. Like you, you just be like, well, get or buy something, and just put those uh, properties like those columns of the table in, and and you should be able to quickly write out your 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 like API calls, right? So that's why get those out right after your back of the envelope. Right? Got it. Cool. That makes sense. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw back to Albert. I need to go yeah. to the restroom real quick, but uh, yes. Well, no problem. Thank you so much, Fong. Uh, that was really good. We appreciate your time today. Uh, and we appreciate all of you who joined us for a technical mock interview. We hope to do more of these. And if you enjoyed this event, we've got so many more going on on Albert's List via the Eventbrite or Meetup page that you found this event on. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Fong, for your time. Thank you, Abhinav. I think you seem like you're getting towards being prepared for your next mock interview. And we'll see you all again soon. Have a rest, so great rest of your week and see you all later. Bye.